Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. For those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. We're thrilled to be hosting this afternoon's webinar on co the COVID-19 vaccine deployment process. This briefing is the final event in the first theme of our 2020 signature series, Disruptors and Transformers, which has explored the short and long-term impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its potential to significantly transform our healthcare system. And today we will focus that on the vaccine effort. I'd like to take a moment to thank our 2020 Signature Series sponsors and remind everyone that you can use today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive and follow us at AllHealthPolicy. We want you all to be active participants, so please do get your questions ready. And here's how you do it. You should see a dashboard on the right-hand side of your web browser with a little speech bubble icon. Um, you can use that speech bubble icon with the question mark in case you have questions, as well as any technical issues. And finally, um, you, uh, if you have additional technical issues, you can use the um, troubleshooting tips or technical support in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Finally, please be sure to check out our website, allhealthpolicy.org, where you will be able to find background materials and a recording of today's webinar, as well as materials and recordings from the rest of our signature series. And now I am very pleased today to be introducing Dr. Reed Tuxen to moderate today's discussion. Not only is he a member of the National Academies of Medicine uh, Framework for Equitable Allocation of Vaccines for the Novel Coronavirus um, Task Force, he is also the Managing Director of Tuxen Health Connections, and he is the Chair of the Alliance for Health Policy Board. Dr. Tuxen, thank you so much for joining us today. And now I'll turn it over to you to introduce the discussion and our panelists. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. We appreciate this. As the race for a COVID-19 vaccine approval continues, the need for a multi-stakeholder national vaccine deployment strategy is becoming more urgent. With ambitious dose manufacturing goals and increased pressure to make COVID-19 vaccines accessible to everyone as quickly as safely as possible, it is crucial to identify and understand potential challenges that our healthcare system will need to overcome in these pursuits. This briefing will explore the manufacturing, distribution, delivery, and coverage approaches that are so necessary to enable nationwide COVID-19 vaccine uptake. Our three especially knowledgeable panelists will discuss manufacturing and workforce infrastructure issues, equitable allocation strategies, payment and coverage tactics for approved vaccines, and examine facilitators and barriers to a successful nationwide immunization deployment. Well, let's get right to it. And we will begin with our great colleague, Esther Kropa, who is the executive director of Faster Cures, a center of the Milliken Institute that focuses on building a patient-centric health system where science is accelerated and barriers are overcome. Esther, uh, what are your opening thoughts, please? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tuxen, and thanks so as well to, to Sarah, the entire team at the Alliance for Health Policy for having me on this webinar. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation over the next 90 minutes. Um, I wanted to provide um, a level set on where we are with development of COVID-19 vaccines, but importantly, we should, we should start with treatments as well. Um, if we can get the slides up, I'd like to go through a few slides to show us where we are. If you go on to the next slide, early in March, we at Faster Cure started to track the development of both therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19 and created what we call our COVID-19 treatment and vaccine tracker that we've been updating daily since March. And, and for those of you who can imagine, it is actually a monumental task to keep up with what's happening globally in this really highly evolving landscape. Um, at the moment, we have uh, identified and are tracking 316 compounds that are either novel or repurposed compounds, as well as efforts to scan additional compounds that could be useful for this virus, and then 213 different vaccine efforts underway. If we go to the next slide, 
Um, just to start uh, on the treatment side, because I do think it's important to understand that while we are in this hot pursuit for a vaccine, there are a number of efforts that are underway from a therapeutic perspective as well. For those of you who are familiar with the HIV story, you will recall that even as vaccine development and research continues 30 years later, we were able to get to highly effective therapies for HIV to control that virus and in some, in some ways suppress even the transmission of that virus. Um, so it's important to understand what's happening with treatments as well, and then we'll get into the vaccine discussion. On the treatment side, um, there are a number of compounds that are broken down into the categories that you see on your left, whether antibodies, antiviral, cell-based therapies, RNA-based treatments, as well as even devices um, and the use of devices in patients, particularly to address issues in the lungs. Uh, 204 of these are in clinical trials or being used for compassionate use, 112 are in preclinical trials. Many of you are familiar with what's already been approved through emergency use authorization, including remdesivir early on through an NIH study was found to be effective, moderately effective in reducing the time to recovery from patients who were in ICU. A UK study identified dexamethasone, a corticoid steroid, that was also found to have uh, effect in reducing mortality for about a fifth of patients, uh, severely ill patients as well in ICU. Uh, convalescent plasma very recently was provided emergency use authorization, again, for ill patients. 49 of the 204 compounds that we are tracking are in phase three clinical trials, but the totality represents over 2,500 clinical trial efforts that are underway globally. Um, we should really be paying attention to what I call the master protocol clinical trial efforts underway. These are adaptive design uh, trials focused on therapeutics uh, on the compounds that I, I have here in the blue. The most notable ones are ACTIVE, which is a public-private partnership underway um, at NIH established by Dr. Francis Collins um, that's looking at monoclonal antibodies, immune modulators, um, anticoagulants are also part of that study, recovery in the UK outside of the US, solidarity through the WHO. So a number of efforts are underway to get to an effective therapeutic, which I do believe plays into this entire story with regard to, to vaccines as well. If we go to the next slide, I'll spend more time here talking about where we are in terms of vaccines. As I mentioned, 213 vaccines in development for COVID-19 that fall into nine different product categories. Um, some of these categories are well studied and understood. Others are new and novel. For example, the mRNA platform that many of the vaccines that are in later stage clinical trials um, do not currently have a commercialized or licensed vaccine on the market. Um, however, because of the nature of that technology, it's allowed the process uh, to get to a viable vaccine for study to move much more quickly. Um, so that, that will be interesting to watch how the clinical trials for novel technologies like the mRNA platform. Others, of course, uh, have been tried and tested and used um, many times over in the past. Uh, we know a lot of the uh, vaccine development efforts outside of the U.S. are using mechanisms like an inactivated virus or a live attenuated virus that have some potential risk of carrying a live virus um, directly to patients. Um, so not many here happening here in the U.S., but we do see some of those efforts outside of the U.S. If you go on to the next slide, it's important to understand the clinical trial process. Um, many, of course, are watching these efforts quite closely, there are some emerging concerns. Are we moving too fast? And in order for us to answer that question, we need to look at what the different stages of clinical trials are. All of the vaccine efforts underway will follow the stages of clinical development that are outlined here. Uh, stage one clinical trials focuses on safety, uh, generally fewer than 100 patients, typically lasts one to two years. Um, and this is being accelerated, of course, in the time of COVID, but still going through that rigorous safety assessment through a phase one study. 
phase two studies are typically in hundreds of patients continuing to monitor safety, but also testing dosage of what is the appropriate dose to give to different patient populations in order to realize um, the effect that is desired in the body in the case of the vaccine to see the immune response, whether the immune response is at or greater than those who are, are convalescent patients or have a neutralizing effect on the virus. Uh, phase three studies where a number of the vaccine efforts are focused right now occur in thousands of patients. We see a range right now with the phase three clinical trials underway with, with some product developers ranging from 30,000 patients enrolled in those studies all the way through to 60,000 anticipated patients enrolled in those studies typically takes two to four years to get through a phase three clinical trial. And the phase four is the post-approval, uh, post-marketing phase where you're continuing to monitor uh, safety in the population based on real world conditions, um, continuing to monitor uh, manufacturing facilities to ensure ongoing quality and safety. At this point, we have 35 of those uh, vaccine candidates I referenced earlier of the 213, 35 are in one of these stages of clinical trial. If you go on to the next slide, I would note here a few of the vaccine candidates that uh, a number of you would have heard a lot about in the media and the press. Uh, Moderna, which is a partnership with the National Institutes of Health, is in phase three clinical trial. They anticipate being fully enrolled by the end of, of this month, uh, September, at about 30,000 patients leveraging the NIH network, um, leveraging and using an mRNA platform. The BioNTech and Pfizer collaborations, also similarly in a phase two, phase three clinical trial, anticipate enrolling 44. Uh, thousand uh, patients and and that study is well underway with expectations um, that has been stated by the company and others that they will be read out by this fall later this fall. AstraZeneca University of Oxford partnership this is a global effort with, with trials that are occurring all over the world including in Brazil in, in South Africa as well as in the UK they're in phase three clinical trial Johnson and Johnson and, and, and others, as you see here. So a, a number of, of these companies are very well experienced in vaccine development, have been doing it for decades and decades. If you go on to the next slide, another hot button topic that's emerged is um, differentiating what would be permissible through emergency use authorization versus full licensure biologics license application. I mentioned early from a therapeutic perspective that emergency use authorization has been provided for uh, two therapeutics, um, remdesivir and convalescent plasma. The EUA allows um, the FDA to allow the use of unapproved medical products um, in emergency situations where there are no uh, proven products that are, are, are definitively identified as, as beneficial to patients. So if there is a signal that that product is uh, potentially beneficial and safe, the FDA has latitude to allow its use through emergency use authorization and define the scope of that use. Um, typically for vaccines, they go through a full licensure process. Licensure applications are submitted after a product developer has completed preclinical studies, animal studies, lab studies, as well as the three phased in human clinical trial studies and provides their full application, including details on manufacturing and quality control to the FDA. Included in that, that type of application are product and manufacturing information, the preclinical studies, clinical studies, and expected labeling information. This, in, this process typically takes one to two years, and once the FDA approves that, they continue to monitor the vaccine development process, as well as inspecting the manufacturing facilities. Um, many of you will note the FDA has, has stated that they are expecting manufacturers that are developing COVID-19 vaccines to be um, a, to target about 50% efficacy 
uh, for either an EUA or a licensure application. And, and of course, we're, we're hoping for something much greater than that, but that is the current target right now. If we go to the next slide, questions are going to emerge and have already around allocation, distribution, and administration of the vaccine in the US. The National Academy of Sciences was directed by the NIH to develop an allocation framework of equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines as an input. They provided a draft of that uh, last, just earlier this month, uh, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, provided opportunity for public comment. Um, I, I believe they received about 1,400 comments. Uh, so it shows there's a very engaged public around this process. That provides an input into a US government approach where the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, which is responsible for providing recommendations on the target patient population uh, to use the input from that National Academy's uh, report as well as working with the Centers for Disease Control and Operation Warp Speed as they are in the midst of evidence generation toward the vaccines that are in that process. Guidelines coming out of the US government will be provided to state, local, tribal, and territorial authorities to implement at that level. The US government has identified McKesson as a third party distributor of these vaccines, there are potential for some manufacturers to distribute the vaccines directly, particularly in cases where there are ultra cold um, storage requirements. The Pfizer vaccine, for example, needs to be kept frozen at very, very cold temperature. Um, given the nature and the logistics behind it, it's possible that they might uh, distribute that themselves or go through, go through McKesson. We are going to have some challenges in distribution. We'll get much more into this on the rest of the webinar. Uh, hard to reach areas, hard to reach populations, tracking uh, the dosage. Most of these vaccines, with the exception of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, are two dose regimens. You need to take a first shot, either 21 days, um, as in the case of the Pfizer, or 28 days, as in the case of the Moderna vaccine, you need to get your second dose. So tracking and monitoring that two dose regimen is going to be quite important. And alongside the vaccines or all of the equipment that are needed to administer glass vials, syringes, appropriate PPE for the healthcare workers. Um, if you go to the final slide and then um, we'll turn it back over to Dr. Tuxen, we are all very mindful of the current climate that we're in. Uh, in terms of vaccine hesitancy. I will say um, vaccine use is, is actually traditionally quite high, particularly for pediatric vaccines. Um, and and we, what we tend to see are on the margins, um, sentiments against vaccines. We are hearing more and more concern about uptake of these vaccines. I think primarily out of concern that there are shortcuts being taken. Uh, which as I described earlier, all of these vaccines are going through the different stages of clinical trial, but there are some concerns that there are some shortcuts occurring, which might be contributing to the hesitancy. Um, recent poll, um, as you can see here, is showing uh, from Pew on the far right, is showing that uh, compared to May earlier this year, where 72% of all adults say they will get a vaccine, um, either definitely probably um, will get a vaccine, we're now down to 51% of adults in September um, that said that they're likely to get a vaccine. And of course, to see the differences depending on, on your politics. Um, so that is certainly an uphill climb that we're going to have to address. A lot of that is going to be focused on education around what a vaccine is, education on the development process, and of course, bringing in different patient populations into the clinical trial process. So I'll just pause there and uh, turn it back over to Dr. Tuxen and look forward to the Q&A. Esther, that was a terrific way to uh, launch this, uh, this uh, presentation and, and, and conversation. Thank you very much. I'm happy now to turn to Nicolette uh, Louisant, um, who is the Executive Director and President of Healthcare Ready an organization that 
leverages relationships with medical supply chains to enhance resiliency before, during, and after disasters. And she will help give us some insight into the building blocks of vaccine manufacturing and distribution from bench to body, and help us also maybe to level set on some important definitions and terminologies so that we'll really understand some of the concepts involved. Nicolette, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you all, Dr. Tuxen. Um, I will make my remarks uh, very quick, recognizing that there are many questions and Esther did such a fantastic job covering um, really the breadth and, and the scope of this problem. Um, I, I really will focus on a, a few points to really dig in a little bit deeper into um, a few of Esther's um, slides, recognizing that, again, she covered much, much of this in her remarks. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that from the vantage point of um, the, the entire um, vaccine manufacturing and distribution process that we are currently building, we are currently using the existing medical countermeasures pipeline and the established public-private partnerships that have been long in place prior to COVID. It's important to recognize that from everything from questions around speed and efficiency of process all the way to addressing some of the challenges that we um, will in, in, in inherently face related to vaccine hesitancy. Um, there are a lot of questions about um, you know, speed of, of being able to move to development, the trial process, um, all the way to what it actually looks like to have an efficient distribution process. And we should recognize that many of those processes have been in place. On the distribution side, um, you know, I, I think we're going to get into a lot of the questions related to medical distribution, but it's important for us to think about it in a few phases. The first being um, the, the question of movement of product from the manufacturer to the distributor. So that third party distributor, um, currently the primary is McKesson, as Esther noted, um, that product will have to get there. And then from that cold storage um, capacity, then moving to the states. And then there is the um, long, long dreaded last mile question. Um, once that product makes it to the states, it then has to be distributed across that state. And that is a separate logistical undertaking. Um, and I know many states are working on their plans and micro plans that are in revision with the CDC now. And a lot of the um, pilot work that was done wow, just earlier this month, um, is going to be used to, to help inform those micro plans. But that last mile um, is a critical component of this and very important because um, in addition to just recognizing the logistics uh, across various states, tribes, territories, um, and, and that logistics really do differ based on the populations that um, will need to be vaccinated, um, the facilities that are engaged, it's also going to be different at each of the phases. And so recognizing that what distribution looks like across the state during phase one, where there is limited um, vaccine available and that allocation um, and prioritization is really going to be focused on um, that who, whoever is ultimately deemed to be that, that critical essential workforce um, population. I think many of us um, are putting in guesses, if you will, and, and can, um, reason through who will likely be those first vaccinated. But again, the science is going to drive that as well as um, the recommendations from the Academy's panel um, that ultimately will inform ACIF's direction. Um, and then, you know, really thinking about those later phases when there will be more product available, that will be the point where um, it's really critical to think about what distribution looks like across those various, um, across the states to get to those various facilities and not just what distribution looks like for that single dose, that's when those double, you know, the two dose um, complexities come in, into play. So it's not just getting people to the pharmacy the first time, how do you get them back for the second dose? Um, you know, I also want to just note that as we're thinking through this, it's important to remember that we're not just talking about vaccination, um, vaccination sites being hospitals. So really thinking about broadening our language, broadening our understanding um, at that last mile, that last mile is going to include a number of critical healthcare facilities that will play a very important role, especially in phases two and three. Pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, clinics are all going to be a part of that in addition to the public health sites that are going to be set up and run by the states or the locals. So this is a massive undertaking Public health has been doing a tremendous job trying to coordinate all of these various pieces, but so is the healthcare sector. And so it's important that as we are 
moving through this and even asking questions about distribution, that we are thinking about that middle mile as well as the last mile. And with that, I'm happy to turn the floor back. That is an excellent presentation, Nicolette. Thank you so much. And it uh, falls nicely and quite logically now to be able to uh, turn the uh, hand the baton to Richard Hughes, uh, the managing director of, of and vaccine the preventive services leader for Avalier. Um, there's maybe a mic that needs to be muted somewhere. And we'll hope that that mic will get muted. Um, and so, as I was saying, Richard is the Managing Director in vac for Vaccines and Preventive Services Leader uh, for Avalier Health, which is a community of innovative thinkers dedicated to solving healthcare system challenges. And uh, he is uh, going to focus in actually on that last mile, uh, helping us to understand insights into the general mechanics of how COVID-19 vaccines can be priced and covered by insurance during and after the pandemic, how these policies may vary from payer to payer, and the role of initiatives such as Operation Warp Speed on market launch for one or more of these vaccines. Richard, thanks for joining us. And you might be able to unmute now. Hear me? Yeah, there you go. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. And uh, happy to talk about uh, how vaccines will be covered and paid for uh, over the, the coming months and, and years for COVID. Uh, so, you know, this question, this persistent question, I think on everybody's mind is, is when will we be able to get a vaccine? And as was described nicely by Esther, uh, there are discussions going on with ACIP, with the National Academies around who should receive the vaccine first. So we have this, this layer uh, of allocation and prioritization that you see here. Uh, we have this question around uh, EUA and then ultimately licensure and, and the timing there and then availability of doses. Um, so as doses are rolled out and administered to these various populations, uh, you can see that there are these ups and downs of, of supply and demand. You know, my, my best sort of guesstimate here as to when uh, people will be able to, uh, the general population will be able to receive a vaccine uh, is really toward the end of, uh, of 2021. Um, and, and related to this question about you know, who pays for the vaccine, we're in this period initially, and at least up until that point where we reach the general population, of responding to a pandemic. Uh, and so what you see is the government is in a, in a procurement role, uh, purchasing the doses initially, and has the option to purchase additional doses in the future. Uh, so the government is going to continue, the U.S. government is going to continue to play that role for some time. Uh, there will be an ultimate question about, you know, when does that procurement role ramp down? When, when does the U.S. government turn the responsibility of purchasing doses over to, say, private payers, but perhaps continuing to purchase doses uh, for a safety net population to ensure that everyone has access? So that's a, that's a future question. Uh, but for the uh, conceivable future, you know, we, we can all anticipate that the federal government is going to continue to play the strong role in purchasing doses uh, to, to provide initial doses uh, in this public health response phase. Now, ultimately, as everyone knows, there are lingering questions about whether this will be a pandemic vaccine uh, or an endemic vaccine. So is, is COVID going to become endemic uh, in, in the U.S.? Is this something that we're going to you know, continue to have to fight on, on a regular basis, like, like flu or RSD. Uh, will, it, will it be seasonal? And that really comes down to, uh, you know, we, we need to know more about the duration of immunity of all of the vaccines that are in the pipeline. Uh, and, and that will uh, help us understand both of those factors, the endemicity and the duration of immunity, will help us uh, understand whether we need to you know, give this vaccine on a seasonal basis. And, you know, really that, that uh, is going to make a difference in the future in terms of uh, whether the government needs to continue to procure vaccines, uh, whether we need sort of the same seasonal infrastructure and approach to vaccine distribution that we have today for flu, or does it look something more uh, like a, a one and done pneumococcal vaccine? Um, and happy to answer additional questions about some of these tipping points uh, later in the Q&A, but I think we can move on to uh, the discussion around coverage. So, 
you know, there is, I find, a lot of confusion and lack of clarity about, you know, initially there was discussion about whether the vaccine would be affordable. Um, I think that is a little bit of a, of a misguided question. Um, there are mechanisms in place to ensure access and, and to the extent that there is fragmentation and, and resulting disparities, those issues existed uh, prior to, uh, to COVID and, and, and we can talk about how they'll affect access to the COVID vaccine. Uh, there is a separate question about affordability to the U.S. government and how the vaccine will be priced. And, you know, initially there was a lot of discussion about, about pricing. Uh, we've seen a number of price announcements so far, uh, so, so pricing is starting to become uh, more of a known. Um, this is a little bit of a different um, situation because companies are, are setting a price in a, in a pandemic uh, environment. Um, it's really sort of... Um, you know, we're coming at this sort of backwards from a pricing standpoint. So I think we can anticipate that pricing will continue to evolve uh, as we see which candidates make it to market, uh, which ones are more or less effective, and uh, just how things really play out as we looked at that tipping point slide. Uh, we can expect that pricing will evolve in the future. But I, I, I view that as a very separate question from affordability to the patient, and I'll, I'll explain why. So uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, payers uh, were able to set their own coverage policies with respect to vaccines and other preventive services. Uh, when Congress passed the Affordable Care Act, it added Section 2713 uh, to the Public Health Service Act. Uh, that's what we all commonly know as the first dollar coverage provision. It requires that all ACIP recommended vaccines must be covered by commercial payers. And so that includes self-insured, non-self-insured, that includes the exchange market, uh, all of those plans must cover vaccines without cost sharing. Now, under ordinary circumstances, uh, a plan has a very long runway to implement a coverage policy following an ACIP recommendation. So uh, essentially the ACIP makes a recommendation and one calendar year elapses and the plan has until the following plan year after that to implement the, the coverage. That could mean up to two years before a plan is required to cover a vaccine first dollar. Now, Congress uh, and the CARES Act uh, took care to, um, you know, speed that timeline up. So essentially, payers will have 15 days from an ACIP recommendation to, uh, to, to cover the vaccine. So we can anticipate that uh, payers, as I said, gov the government will play this role of a procurer. Uh, payers will still be responsible for reimbursing the administration fees uh, where they would otherwise be required to cover the vaccine. So government purchasing the dose, uh, payer paying the administration fee. The best analog that we have for this today is the Vaccines for Children program. So today, the government, uh, CDC, purchases through federal contracts with, uh, with manufacturers and, and, and with CMS financial backing. They purchase vaccines, provide those to the states for the eligible population. And then Medicaid programs and payers in the Medicaid market, they reimburse for the administration fee uh, for the dose that was, that was given by the federal government to the state. Uh, so that is essentially the scenario we're looking at uh, in, this, in this phase of government vaccine procurement for COVID with payers paying administration fees. So the uh, coverage requirements that I just articulated for the commercial market, that also applies to Medicaid expansion programs. Um, I don't have the count in front of me, but we know that a number of states, of course, have not expanded Medicaid. And in those states, in traditional Medicaid, uh, the ACA did not apply here. So states still have the ability to determine whether or not they will cover a vaccine in traditional Medicaid. And we have historically, since the ACA, seen quite a bit of variability in vaccine coverage there. That is a notably uh, vulnerable population. They have a lot of low-income pregnant women in this population, and so that's something that, of course, uh, we'll, we'll want to, uh, to address with the states. Uh, now, uh, if, you, if you know how vaccine coverage works, you know that Medicare is different because the Affordable Care Act did not address vaccine coverage in Medicare like it did for the commercial market. Uh, what we've seen is since the 1980s, pneumococcal and flu vaccines are covered in Part B, and all other vaccines are covered in Part D following the Medicare Modernization Act, which created Part D. Uh, 
this has really meant that uh, D vaccines have more access barriers. They, they are subject to out of pocket, unlike uh, commercial health insurance, vaccines uh, are, uh, are subject to out of pocket in Part D. Uh, that is a notable access barrier for Part D vaccines, whereas in Part B, pneumococcal and flu vaccines are covered without cost sharing, just like in the commercial market. Congress also had the wisdom in the CARES Act to place the COVID vaccine in Medicare Part B. So essentially seniors will have access to uh, the vaccine under Medicare Part B, which is uh, you know, traditionally a, a physician benefit. So uh, what CMS will need to do to sort of effectuate access uh, to the COVID vaccine, similar to pneumococcal and influenza, is they'll need to set up a roster billing process so that pharmacists, uh, other non-traditional healthcare providers, public health clinics, outpatient facilities, so that they can bill to the vaccine as it's covered under Part B. Uh, and then, you know, I, I would just note here, there is an ongoing discussion, this is sort of in the background of COVID, about the adequacy of administration fees uh, for vaccines. The Medicare Physician Fee Schedule uh, for a long while has linked vaccine administration fees to uh, codes for other administrations, so injectable drugs, and now CMS is proposing to link it to catheterization. Uh, which is a step in the right direction because that will result in higher reimbursement for administration fees. But there's a strong feeling among immunization stakeholders that administration fees are not reflective of what it really takes a practice to vaccinate the patient. The cost of storing and handling, buying, filling vaccines, counseling patients, uh, it's just not all adequately accounted for in their view uh, through administration fees as they are today. And we know that the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule dictates, uh, you know, indirectly uh, fees across other markets. Payers uh, rely on and reference the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. So it really has a very broad effect. Um, and then as we look ahead, we can anticipate, as I mentioned, you know, once the government steps back in its role as procurer uh, of the COVID vaccine during this pandemic phase, we can anticipate that, you know, that the, the government will then want in the future to, to consider safety net populations and providing access uh, through safety net approaches, such as the 317, Section 317 program, which is a program that allows the federal government to purchase vaccines for adults and, and states have access to that program. And so that's a mechanism by which we can make sure that uninsured individuals in, in the future have access to the vaccine. Uh, some states do purchase uh, vaccines uh, either through the federal contract uh, or uh, there has been some discussion of states wanting to buy their own vaccines. So that, um, that's something that, that we could potentially see uh, play out in the future. Uh, as I think everybody knows, uh, children um, are going to essentially be one of the last populations recommended to receive uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, ultimately, the Vaccines for Children program, as I described it earlier, would instantly kick in uh, to provide that access to, um, to the COVID vaccine. So uh, that is essentially the, uh, you know, the, co the coverage framework for the vaccine and how it will be accessed by patients. And uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That was uh, outstanding. And so what we will start to do now is to uh, remind our audience uh, to submit questions uh, uh, using the uh, question button on your uh, attendee interface. And as you start to do that, let me uh, have the enjoyment of the moderator to ask our panelists a few quick questions and start with Esther. Esther, uh, two quick, quick things. Number one, um, you described the number of, of uh, clinical trials that are going on with treatment uh, 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 initiatives as well as vaccine initiatives that are around the world. What, if any, impact does our leaving, uh, the United States leaving the uh, World Health Organization and the fractured or challenging geopolitical realities that are confronting the world today, what, if any, implications do that, does that have for uh, the ability to uh, provide the American people with access to what's going on uh, with developments in, around the world? You know, that's an excellent question, and, and I think it's it's um, quite important question, particularly in the context of addressing this as a pandemic, 
right? It's not happening just here in the US, it's happening all over the world. Um, and we just hit that grim milestone, right, of a million deaths globally as a result of COVID-19. So for us to contain this virus globally, we need to have access to vaccines for the global population. And right now, the implications of the US leaving the WHO are that efforts like the COVAX facility, which is a collaboration between Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, as well as the WHO, to ensure that countries have access to the vaccine. Notably, the US is, is not included in that. They've, they've uh, made the decision to not participate in the COVAX facility, which essentially allows companies to, uh, or countries rather, to pool their resources for advanced purchase of, um, of, of vaccines as they're coming from these different, th these different companies. And what the US has said is they're going to pursue this in a bilateral way. They'll negotiate with individual companies to secure access to the vaccine. Um, we do, of course, have other global actors, including efforts um, through the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, uh, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, WHO and others, that are quite focused on how do we ensure that low to middle income countries or any country that participates in the COVAX facility um, does get access to the vaccine. But we absolutely need to look at this as a global issue. We need to solve for this as a global issue if we can ever think about reopening not just our country, but all global borders. Great, thank you so much. Um, and um, by the way, related to that, um, uh, we are getting a question that that deals with the notion of, of trade implications for uh, the distribution of the vaccine. Uh, if it's coming from abroad, uh, could the United States impose export restrictions similar to uh, uh, PPE limits? Do, do you sort of see any of that? Do you, any of you see that as an issue? Um, I will let maybe Nicolette, if you're, you're focused on that last mile, I, I'm not sure what the trade implications specifically would be in terms of how the U.S. will um, inhibit the, the, the distribution and allocation conversations uh, globally. Um, there are some countries um, that are following the steps of the U.S. and saying, you know what, I'll go at it alone and, and try to secure our own supplies alone. Um, rather than this pooling strategy that I just talked about, which of course does not bode well in locking up supply by companies and not necessarily having sufficient supply available for distribution um, for you know broader uh, economies in other countries. So again, that bilateral single country securing advanced purchase of the vaccine directly um, does not help to solve this from a global allocation perspective, but I'll let others comment. So I would suggest um, that um, the for the first, if, if we look at this in phases, um, what Esther has highlighted in terms of the COVAX facility um, and the cooperation happening there, um, we, we really have to think about it from the vantage point of which countries have invested in which products. And based on the products that um, eventually get EUAs or approvals, whether in our regulatory system or others, um, the countries that have invested in those particular products will um, have also purchased product um, from, from those manufacturers. I think as we think about later phases, specifically phase, phase three and on, that's where we um, may begin to see questions of um, in the open market, um, what products are being manufactured in the US but being procured by other countries. But I think for this immediate phase, um, more of the questions are going to pertain to um, for the products that are currently in development, whichever products end up um, being successful in moving to an approval, it's going to be the countries that have invested in that development that will have access to that product, which could potentially put the U.S. at a disadvantage if there are other products that are being invested in within that COVAX facility, for example, that um, reach approval first or see, you know, demonstrated success first. But that's not really a trade or distribution problem. That That's just about investment in the countermeasure pipeline. Thank you so much. Esther, let me come back to you for a minute. You uh, mentioned the percentages of Americans who uh, 
are not willing to, or, or indicating they're not willing to accept even a free vaccine at this point. And 35% uh, uh, of the American people across the board, but four in 10 minorities uh, for well-known reasons of, of uh, past uh, misadventures between uh, the black community and scientific establishment that leads to a certain level of, of, of uh, distrust and current political environment adding to it. My question to you is um, enrollment in clinical trials, which you really laid out quite wonderfully. What happens if there are not adequate numbers of minorities who decide to participate in clinical trials? Will the vaccine still be, uh, um, uh, uh, will the vaccine still be approved and put out into the open market? And, and if so, what do we say to minority Americans um, of, the, of, of the safety of that vaccine for their particular population? You know, such an important question, I think really based on the experience to date that disproportionate numbers of minority populations have suffered from, from COVID relative to others, whether in morbidity or, or in mortality. And it's extremely important that we ensure that population is included in clinical trials, not just on the vaccine side, I would also say on the therapeutic side as well. But with regard to vaccines, the FDA has made it clear to product sponsors that the expectation is that minority populations be included in these clinical trials in phase three. Um, and all of these companies, a number of them have made very specific um, efforts to enroll minority populations um, in their clinical trials. Um, for example, Moderna has been fairly successful at enrolling the Latino population in their clinical trials to uh, a percentage that it's you know slightly less than what's reflected in the population uh, writ large. There's some challenges in enrolling the African-American population but um, it's important that that those efforts continue. Um, the FDA is uh, encouraging but not requiring, and I think that's where um, it gets to that second part of your question, Dr. Tuxin, which is that will a vaccine receive emergency use authorization or licensure um, if insufficient numbers of the minority population are not enrolled? And there is not a specific um, regulatory requirement. So I, there, there is no legal stance, I think, for FDA to decline an emergency use authorization or, or BLA. However, there are going to, of course, be um, implications for how those populations perceive recommendations in terms of, of, of uptake. I think what we all can do um, is to be that voice talking about the science, um, encouraging enrollment in these trials, um, maybe doing better than encouraging and, 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 and ensuring the FDA has steps in place uh, to monitor and um, to do their part, right, uh, in, tr in terms of making sure that the product sponsors are being robust in their enrollment practices. But but right now it's, it's really, um, it's a recommendation, but not a requirement. So very likely that we will see a vaccine um, on the market or in limited use um, that might have insufficient numbers. And um, certainly hope that we, we do get the numbers up across the board with all of these vaccine candidates in phase three clinical trials. Well, I hope we do as well, Esther. And I hope that some of the prodigious amounts of money that is being allocated and spent from for manufacturing through distribution that some of that will, a lot more of it will find its way into financing the kinds of engagements with minority communities, African-Americans, Latinx, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, and, and Native Americans who uh, really are going to need it. And I'm terrified, quite frankly, as one observer, that all this money on the front end uh, will be to no avail when you don't have people willing to, uh, to, to deal with that. Nicolette, I want to turn to you on this issue. And you um, gave us great insight on uh, the issue of, of dissemination um, and the pathway down to the local level. I, I wonder, we know, um, and, and I will be cautious as a member of the National Academy uh, Committee on Dissemination, but uh, it has been alluded to that there was a public release of the report. And in that uh, re release, in the public release of the draft, uh, there was uh, a, a, some focus on 
people with multiple chronic illnesses um, uh, who ought to be certainly considered uh, as a very uh, critical element. I'm wondering how you sort of see the capacity of the delivery system at the local level to be able to identify who these high risk people are and then be able to coordinate uh, them uh, being able to have access uh, uh, to, to proven efficacious vaccine. Absolutely, thank you. And I think that's a part of um, this ongoing conversation about uh, diversity in, in, the, in clinical trials. It extends all the way to understanding the diversity of the populations that we're going to need to prioritize and serve. Um, what I think is a really critical part of, of understanding those high risk populations and being able to reach them is understanding where they routinely access healthcare. And so, um, you know, one thing that Healthcare Ready has done quite a bit is to really work through the mapping and understanding of what high risk actually means, um, what chronic diseases are of greatest concern, depending on the hazard. In this case, with COVID-19, we understand that there are certain populations of in chronic disease populations or comorbid populations that we need to be especially concerned about. But understanding where they routinely access healthcare is going to be critical, especially when you're talking about cold chain product, because in reality, in that phase two process, as Richard described, you know, we're going to be really around this time next year seeing a phase two process roll out likely that um, would allow for healthcare facilities to really engage those high risk populations in vaccination. And again, that repeated vaccination, those two visits are probably going to be done at a pharmacy or a clinic. Um, and it's going to be those facilities that would routinely engage those patients. So if you're thinking about a comorbid patient that has uh, multiple prescriptions, they're, they're, the chances are that they're going to be at a pharmacy more frequently than any other form of healthcare, uh, sort of maybe a dialysis center. And so understanding the role of those ancillary care facilities um, and their ability to be able to engage with distributors work with them to understand being able to schedule and plan and then receiving a delivery such that they're able to vaccinate when that person comes in for a routine script, for example, is the opportunity that we have to make sure we're coordinating and taking advantage of. Because the reality for a lot of those individuals is that a hospital visit may not be feasible, but it also could put them at greater risk. So if we're thinking about keeping people out of healthcare systems that are not necessary for their treatment and making sure that they're getting the, the interface with the healthcare facility that's most appropriate for their care, that does mean that that dissemination has to go to multiple facilities. And it also means that our best approach is going to be making sure that we're using the facilities that they routinely engage. So I, one of the, the that sort of follows on there, uh, the notion of, are you confident that our uh, data systems are integrated enough to be able to handle all of that, particularly when you've got to have uh, those vaccines that will require more than one dose? So I, so the existence of our data systems and the integration I think are two different questions. I think we have, um, you know, if you really look at the, the, the robust capacity of medical distribution in this country and the data systems that medical distributors use on a daily basis to move product across the country, it is, it is state of the art. Um, if you also look at the public health systems that are being used and even the, the systems that are being upgraded right now to be able to accomplish um, this mission, we are seeing that there are investments in IT infrastructure. My question is around the integration. I think there's still a lot um, that needs to be done and also needs to be tested because we're talking about integrating systems or pieces of systems that normally do not have to speak to each other, but also have to speak to each other with a cadence um, and a frequency that may not have to be real time, but probably has to be near real time. So I think there is um, a lot to be done, but I also recognize that a big part of the investments that are being made right now by HHS and Operation Warp Speed and the CDC are around IT infrastructure as well as data in integration specifically for public health departments to be able to integrate better with the federal government and with their distributors that they'll be working with on, on routine ordering. I think this is an area that everybody needs to really focus on. I think this is gonna be critical, particularly for people who are poor who are so much of the population of people with multiple chronic illnesses, uh, and how do those individuals become identified? How do they get into the uh, 
vaccine dissemination uh, system and so forth. Richard, I haven't forgotten you, but I'm going to go one more for you, Nicolette. There's a lot of people get confused about this, the meaning of this cold chain storage and how cold is cold. And does that mean that uh, for those vaccines that require that, that that would rule out um, physician offices or small clinics from being able to, uh, to, to handle this? Absolutely. I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've been asked how cold is cold exactly. Um, so my, my best rule of thumb is if you um, are in your refrigerator, we're talking about four to eight degrees Celsius. Your freezer is about minus 20 um, and liquid nitrogen is around between minus 70 and minus 80 C. I think most scientists remember that rule of thumb. So when we're talking about um, cold storage, we're normally talking about either refrigeration or, or, or freezer storage. And in this case, mainly minus 20. Um, so that freezer capacity is important. The ultra cold is the minus 80. Um, my understanding right now is that the Pfizer product would need the ultra cold, but would need to be reconstituted um, prior to um, delivery. And so a lot of the guidance that we've seen and including, I think, some of the public guidance that the CDC has shared has advised public health departments and facilities to not focus on just buying freezer space, not focus on buying freezers, but really work with local logistics networks to understand what's in their state and can be leveraged. Um, I, my, my initial answer to whether or not, um, you know, PCPs would need to, to purchase freezers is no. Um, I think not at this point is pro probably um, a clearer answer. I, I think there are a few reasons for that. One is realistically, um, when we're thinking about the amount of product that, especially in that first phase, maybe the first two phases, will remain on hand, it's going to be very little. So it, what I am expecting, and I think what many people are expecting is that a pharmacy or a clinic or a doctor's office will at some point place the order knowing that they would need to vaccinate the next day. So what they'd receive at the top of the day would be what they use. And so they would just have to have limited capacity to be able to hold that product safely and, and be able to vaccinate throughout the day and do the same thing. So we're talking about more frequent deliveries rather than a, a longer hold of inventory for those types of facilities. But also recognizing that um, while we are talking about delivery to specific facilities, a big part of uh, what I understand the CDC's push to not encourage just purchasing of, of freezers or other um, space is in part because there's recognition that there is local logistics capacity. Many of the um, healthcare distributors and, and cold chain logistics companies have geographical presence across the United States and are prepared to be able to support this movement. So it may not be that the delivery just needs to go to the pharmacy or just needs to go to that doctor's office. There are local third party logistics partners that are prepared to support this and they do have cold chain capacity. So they can hold maybe for you know a day or two inventory for those facilities, and I think that type of coordinated approach, especially until we understand you know are we trying to do this you know as Richard pointed out um, once and and done, or are we are we going to see this being endemic and needing to continue to sustain this year after year? I think the strategy is let's determine how we actually coordinate these types of um, approaches where we're using existing capacity. Um, recognizing that again, there is a lot of cold chain capacity, but it is about making sure that we're using the breadth of the full system and that those st um, states are recognizing all of the local resources that are available to be able to support those facilities. But again, not thinking about long-term inventory. And my expectation is that most facilities would not be housing four to seven days of vaccine at a time, but rather one maximum two days that they would be able to, to safely vaccinate, recognizing that there is a temperature sensitivity to that inventory. So Richard, if I play that out um, and I start thinking about reimbursement, um, my goodness, what? how do we speculate what the uh, insurers are on the hook for and self-insured employers are on the hook for? There are a lot of people who it would seem get to have a bite out of the apple of, of administrative cost. You're gonna have some people that will, will get it uh, from McKesson, have to uh, store it, freeze it, some have to reconstitute it, some are gonna have to uh, deliver it uh, from point A, then back to the doctor's office at point B. Um, is, am, I, am I right to be 
worried about the the, the economic uh, bill that insurers and self-insured employers will have to pay, and then of course how much of that gets passed off to uh, in, in in higher premiums. And Richard, you may be on mute. I was. Thank you. Uh, that's a very that's a very complex question and a very good one. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, there is this sentiment today that administration fees do not adequately compensate providers for the cost of storing and handling vaccines. It's very, very challenging for many practices to uh, maintain the, the, the storage and the refrigeration equipment uh, to deal with issues of, of wastage and, uh, you know, to ensure the product, to um, do all of the, the handling and, and, and then in some markets, as I described, this sort of very fragmented coverage uh, market and the, or fragmented coverage uh, scenarios in the U.S., uh, it can be very difficult for a provider to bill and get reimbursed for, uh, for a vaccine or for administration fees. So uh, it's very costly for practices. Um, you know, it, payers will, uh, as I described, be responsible for the administration fee, which, as I'm saying, may not may or may not cover the practices costs. Uh, they ultimately will be responsible for paying for doses uh, when when the government backs out of that role, but but not until that point. As long as the government is saying we're going to purchase doses for every American, then payers can anticipate that they will not need to bear that cost. So the cost then of getting everything from point A to point B, you know, really is going to depend on uh, adequate uh, public health funding. And, you know, Congress really providing, uh, whether it's Operation Warp Speed or CDC, with the adequate resources uh, so that they can either deploy those resources at the federal level uh, or, you know, provide those resources to the states to, uh, to really coordinate all of this and to ensure that, uh, that it happens. So uh, whether that's, you know, special refrigeration equipment or ensuring that um, the right kits get to the right place, at the, you know, at the right, um, you know, right time, uh, the, the, the building up of, the, of all of the data systems that we're talking about, uh, it will require uh, substantial public resources um, and I, I wouldn't anticipate that that's going to be passed on to payers. It's really going to be, um, you know, public resources that are needed and, and will be reliant on Congress to ensure that that funding is there and, and the federal government to, to, to really um, provide those resources. Because this is, a, after all, a public health, um, a public health, it demands a public health response. I know that you, uh, you know, this is a very complex time. Um, but I just sort of wonder whether you've had enough ability to have any insight as to whether or not our government agencies uh, coordinating with state agencies actually have the ability to implement something as complex as this and be able to parse out, again, the economic chain so that there won't be uh, huge fistfights in, in, a, in a couple of months regarding who pays, you know, will, will we see, is it conceivable that we will see a slowing down of the ability to get a vaccine into someone's arm uh, simply because the, 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 the economic supply line chain uh, is, is, is going to be uh, challenged uh, because there's so many different steps, so many different permutations and not unclarity as to who, who, uh, who gets paid for what and how much. Yeah, again, a very complex, multi-layered question and, a, and a, very, a very good one. I, um, you know, as I said, I, uh, I don't know if I mentioned today, but I worked on the H1N1 uh, response. I was at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials in 2009 and, uh, you know, worked with the states and worked with other uh, NGOs uh, and, and the CDC in coordinating the response. And I saw the tremendous coordination across levels of government that occurred. And we were on calls every single day with uh, the health officers, the epidemiologists, the immunization programs, all talking with the CDC, all planning and, and coordinating and, and preparing to ramp up for uh, that seasonal, um, that, that, that flu season uh, to administer the H1N1 vaccine in addition to the regular flu vaccine. And, and it worked really well. And, you know, I think in, in this, um, in this pandemic, what we saw was 
you know, in April, the CDC came out and said, we will do what we did during H1N1. And everybody says, oh, yeah, that's, that's familiar. We know how that works. There's, there's good coordination. Uh, there's infrastructure there. Uh, now, are there hiccups and are, you know, immunization information systems lagging, as we all were discussing earlier? Of course. Uh, but there's a tried and true infrastructure and collaboration right. between states and the federal government through CDC. Uh, where states can place their orders, they plan in advance, they have people at the CDC that they work very closely with to, to do all of that planning. Uh, and so, you know, we anticipated that that would be the case here. Shortly after that, Operation Warp Speed, when it was announced and stood up, uh, the focus became, you know, DOD is in charge and DOD will deploy this vaccine and then distribute the product. And, and there were even questions about whether DOD would administer the product. And people, you know, we were talking to, against the backdrop of, of everything that's going on with Black Lives Matter. Uh, is the Army going to come out and vaccinate people? Gosh, what would that be like? Um, you know, and, and it's sort of um, a scary, scary thought. And um, ultimately, they said, you know, this will be the responsibility of, of the CDC after all. Um, so we tilted back in a direction where we're saying, okay, we'll rely on traditional public health actors in the federal government. Um, so I think we, we might have lost some time. Uh, there, there has been a significant amount of confusion and a lot of focus on standing up new systems. Um, and it'll, it, you know, it remains to be seen how well it will all play out. Um, I think we're going to experience some challenges. I do. Um, I think that there sometimes... Um, is an inherent disconnect between public health and healthcare. Uh, our healthcare system has evolved significantly over the last decades. Uh, if you look at adult immunization prior to COVID, we we have not overcome the challenges that we that we the, the baseline challenges that we have in vaccinating adults. So anybody over the age of 18, there are unique challenges, especially between 18 and 64. Um, and, and vaccinating adults. And so we've not done very well as a, as a country with, with routine vaccines for these populations. Uh, so can we do it now? Um, you know, I, I think that we can anticipate that there will be some, you know, system breakdowns. Uh, but I also think we can anticipate that it'll just, it'll just be hard to get patients to show up and get the, the vaccine. Uh, well, Richard, get, I just, yeah, please. Yeah. That's that's a great, great, great response. I'm going to come to Esther in a second, but let me just ask you one, just make one observation. I think you're right in terms of learning from the H1N1 experience. And I think a lot of things did go well. But though, because of our audience, and we have so many people who are very smart and don't focus in on details, there was a great deal of confusion, particularly at the, at the 11th hour, between whether or not uh, employers uh, and insurers uh, what would be there, what would there be in the hook on, and whether or not the administration fees uh, by pediatricians in particular were going to be waived or, 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 uh, or paid. And uh, it, 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 it was a issue that cost several millions of dollars uh, to the people who pay for health care. Uh, so there is some need to be very focused on this chain of events of, 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 of uh, who gets paid for what? And this is going to be much more complicated than H1N1. So I think it's very important. Uh, I'm glad you, I appreciated your answer. Esther, let me, on, since Richard just mentioned about uh, the experience that so many have had uh, in our country of not using vaccines, and we've got enormous campaigns uh, by, um, by uh, I won't try to categorize the people, but people who are deliberately trying to sow uh, distrust and confusion about vaccines. Um, what do you sort of see will happen here? And what, if anything, can be done uh, to try to overcome the anxiety uh, that so much of the population has and is increasingly having about whether or not they are willing to accept a vaccine, even when approved uh, as safe and efficacious by the FDA? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think it's a very important question because what we really need to, to come back to and, and emphasize to the general public is the important role of science. Um, now more than ever, we're relying on science and scientists to not only identify what potentially we already have that's been approved that could have an effect, 
on mitigating this virus from a therapeutic perspective, but also a vaccine that hopefully can get us all out of this um, as, as we increase that uptake. And so going back to the important role that science has, maintaining the independence of the scientific and medical community and being able to go through this very well-defined scientific process of clinical trials and evaluation of drugs and products is going to be very important. Um, I think it's important that we communicate the independence of the FDA in making decisions around the, the data and what the data show, um, and that we make those decisions accordingly for the right populations and not make any prejudgments on what that data show. Um, if we can continue to demonstrate this to the public, I think it will address those issues of, of trust, which is really where all of this is based. Um, even when we talked about the poll earlier, we did see high, um, you know, in the poll at least reflections that individuals, they want to get a vaccine, they want to get back to normal. I think over the course of the last several months and um, unfortunately, um, you know, some attacks on public health agencies and, and maybe some missteps, we've seen some of that erode. Um, as I described, these products, these vaccine candidates are going through a clinical trial process. They're going through safety and going through efficacy. We certainly need to continue to monitor safety over a period of time. Um, as well, any adverse events that do show up in the population and continue to ensure that we are providing high efficacy across different populations, including the elderly or who are immune comp or those who are immune compromised that might have um, a harder time getting to the kind of, of immune response that we're looking at in other populations. So I just think the basis of this is going to be science. I think it's communicating the scientific process. I think it's letting the medical experts and researchers do that communication and maintaining the independence of our public health agencies, our regulators, um, and our providers. I will uh, make a moderator's uh, comment uh, and just say, uh, Esther, in addition to your excellent point, you know, it, it really pains me to see the level of distrust that, that is being built for the extraordinary public servants who work in our health agencies. And I will say to you that the FDA in particular, uh, I know some of these people who are the ones on the point who have to make the decision for safety and efficacy. And these are really good people. They're smart, they're dedicated, and they're not going to be easily manipulated. Now, I hope that we can elevate their profile. But in addition to that, if there are FDA people who are uh, listening in on the call, I'm urging you, begging you to do more uh, information about the external advisory committees. Uh, one of the great things about the American uh, health uh, uh, and, and medical care system uh, are the number of external citizens who devote countless hours in support of our federal agencies, NIH, CDC, FDA. And one thing for sure is these people will be uh, knowledgeable about what's going on. They will see the data uh, prior to any decision. And I think we need to elevate those external voices a lot higher so that people understand the process is very publicly transparent and this is not being done in a black box. But that was just a moderator's comment. Let me turn to Nicolette and Richard and sort of ask you a little bit, some of our uh, 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 attendees are curious about the notion of who actually purchases the vaccine um, at, at the federal level. Is this being you know, sort of purchased by HHS, DOD, VA? Uh, sort of how is it working that this gets purchased? And then related to that, uh, there is a, another kind of question. Will employers and or wealthy people be able to in run the system and be able to buy their own vaccines uh, outside of the process, even when there is a, uh, a prioritization that uh, uh, recommendations that are being made by the National Academy of Medicine, by the, um, by the ACIP and others that are making these decisions about prioritization. Will rich folks and, uh, and uh, employers, self-insured employers, will they be able to in run uh, whatever agency that is buying these uh, on behalf of the United States. Uh, I'll open that for either you, Nicolette, and or Richard. And don't be shy. <laughs> 
Richard, I'm happy to go after you. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to address that. Uh, so, you know, my, my understanding today is that uh, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response entered into the contracts with uh, all of the contracts that are publicly known today, uh, that those were entered into through that part of HHS with a substantial amount of financial backing from DOD. Uh, that is different than, you know, that their stockpiling purchasing that, that typically occurs through ASPR, but that is different than what, what we've seen the federal government typically do in contracting to purchase vaccines. So traditionally, the CDC does negotiate with manufacturers to purchase vaccine, and there are federal contracts for, for most vaccines. There are a couple that, that the federal government doesn't purchase, but for the most part, CDC purchases vaccines. And uh, that, that's typically for the Vaccines for Children program, for the Section 317 program that I mentioned. Uh, and the, the CDC contracts are not being used um, at, at this time. I would imagine in the future, as, as warp speed winds down, as we, as we just go forward you know, into different phases of, of this, that, that ultimately this will transition to a place where CDC is the primary procurer of, of vaccine. Um, to answer the question around, you know, the ability to sort of purchase outside the system, it's, I mean, a couple of, um, you know, thoughts there. I, I think um, the recommendations of the ACIP, of course, informed by the, the National Academies, um, I, I was asked last week, do states have to follow that? And, and, and they really don't. Um, and I think it, you know, on, on the one hand, the recommendations are, are very important to follow and uh, that, that they're evidence-based and they should be followed. Uh, however, you know, I, I said last week, I think to the extent that a state has the insight into, you know, particular uh, situations in, in, in its own borders where a, a particular area is affected or a particular population is affected and they need to tweak recommendations so that they can overcome access disparities or really target the response that, that that's appropriate. That's appropriate for states to do, and they have the authority to do that. Uh, so really, the same answer applies, I think, to you know who is allowed to buy the product. Um, there really aren't any restrictions on that. I think I will say um, I think there is an outstanding question about whether you can sell commercially uh, during an EUA period, and I actually I admittedly don't know the answer to that. But if you're taking that off the table, and we're talking about licensed products. Um, there would be no restriction uh, of the ability for manufacturers to sell products to, you know, to, to states directly, to uh, payers directly, to, to G, uh, you know, group purchasing organizations directly, um, to, to a large employer. So that would be something that, that they would be allowed to do. Um, and uh, so I think to answer your question, Dr. Tuxin, the answer is, is probably yes. Um, but I would, I would like to think that you know, most of the system will try to follow the framework and, and emphasize Thank the you. priority populations. Thanks, Richard. Nicola, do you have a quick one on that one? I do. So I, I think I, there's a slight echo. I just want to make sure we're okay. Okay. So I think um, there are a few things to to unpack in this, and I agree with most of what Richard said. Um, I my understanding is that. The procurement, um, and it, this is again why phases are so important, but the procurement um, of the first 660 million doses um, has been made by the by the U.S. government. And so I think, um, based on my understanding, you know, probably yes is right, um, but also understanding that what's already been procured, um, procured or secured by the U.S. government cannot be upended. But I think as we're thinking about later phases, the, there are other questions that remain. Um, which again, that plays out into the questions of is this, you know, a repeated vaccine or not. Um, also, on the earlier question related to kind of who who is purchasing what, um, I I want to put some context in my understanding of um, which agencies were involved in what procurement, um, recognizing that this is a part of the medical countermeasures enterprise, which has historically um, involved BARDA. Um, as the you know the research and development facility, um, as well as the strategic national stockpile and their capacity to be able to not just hold on to products but to issue those contracts. With the movement of the SNS to ASPR, 
Um, I think a lot of those contracts are now coming out of HHS or HHS ASPR, recognizing that that procurement capacity is now just still within the SNS, but now within a different part of the HHS family. Um, the, the Vaccines for Children program is actually the program that holds the, the contract from, from McKesson, which has been leveraged for this. And so I think what we're seeing is across the HHS family, there are different um, programs that might be housed within ASPR, within the CDC, that are being leveraged. Uh, what I do know, um, and I think was actually publicly shared um, in an article earlier this week, is that um, ASPR is, is making sure that there is um, sign off from ASPR and CDC leadership on the, um, all of these contracts. So whether the, the actual money is coming from the DOD or not, um, or if it's being issued by the SNS or um, by the CDC, there is collective input. And so I think um, that's important to recognize because where the money is coming from versus who is making the final sign off may be two different questions. So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, I that's do great. think yeah, I, I do think it's important to recognize that the OWS um, contracts seem to be a hybrid of HHS and DOD, but the sign-offs are the same. But um, uh, as we start to close out, I want to ask the staff if they will put up the slide that Richard showed that had a long the, the timeline with the um, with the bell-shaped curves. And while you do that. Um, uh, let me come back to you, Nicolette, and I just ask you one thing as a supply chain uh, expert. Um, are you happy, uh, Nicolette, or are you concerned that the entire dissemination process is in the hands of one vendor? Is that uh, good for efficiency, or does that open us up for, for, uh, for risk, but without having redundancy? Sure. I think the for the breadth of this problem, you're going to need the entire system. Um, I think what McKesson has um, been able to invest in is definitely going to, um, especially in phase one, is definitely go going to um, help us meet the need. But I think as we're really thinking about vaccinating all of America, we are going to need um, that, that single system. And so when you look at the capacity of medical distribution in this country, we have tremendous capabilities. And I think our, our best approach is to use all of those capabilities. There are um, not just logistics um, um, questions and capacities, there's also um, the ability to integrate with those last mile recipients, their security um, capacities, and, and there's just a tremendous capacity that we have across the entire system. And so it's my hope that as we continue that we'll be able to learn from those earlier phases um, and, and that the, my expectation is that the full system um, will be engaged in different components of the, the mass vaccination campaign. All right, well, let's put that slide up. And as we close out, I want to ask each one of you as we go around um, is, as I look at this slide, I'm trying to understand what does this mean for predictions about when does this society reopen? When do we become back to sort of something around normal? And so I'm, I, I'm just curious as you all look at what's there. Uh, what are your predictions? And we'll 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 take the, you in the order in which we we uh, began. So we'll start with with Esther, then Nicolette, and then Richard. What does this slide mean to you about reopening the, the, the this nation? Yeah, I mean this is a very you know important slide, interesting slide to see the numbers here, particularly the amount of doses. I mean one thing that it signals right off the bat is is how vast this problem is and how much. Uh, we're going to need to stay coordinated in order to solve for that. This timeline assumes that everything will go perfectly. Um, it assumes that we will get the readout of the phase three studies that show high levels of efficacy and safety against populations, assumes that we'll have people who trust that vaccine um, at the end of the day and the, the uptake is high so that at each point in this, whether we're talking about healthcare personnel, essential workers, high-risk individuals, and the general population, that in some ways we have close to um, high compliance, what's needed essentially to get us toward herd immunity where we don't have the virus circulating as much as we currently have it um, circulating across the country and across the world. I think it's a limited view because it's just of the US. We need to talk about this, as I mentioned earlier, from a global perspective, because it's really about 
solving a pandemic, um, which is borderless. And we need, to, we need to include that picture into this as well. Um, I will say in terms of, you know, when could we reopen again, um, it's going to be a story of vaccines and therapeutics. And if we get to a highly effective therapeutic that reduces mortality rates, that needs to be coupled with vaccinations that may take more time. When I heard Nicolette speak in terms of the complexity of the distribution, um, all of that will add to this timeline. Optimistic that we will start to see access broadly to a vaccine at the end of next calendar year. Um, I would be a little bit more cautious in terms of when we get up to 70 or 80% of the population that has taken it, particularly because we have yet to see the data being read out of these clinical trials. Great. Um, Nicolette? I, I I would first ask um, for us to really think about what normal looks like and what normal means. Um, if we're thinking about um, some level of resumption of the economy, I think that's going to be different than um, people being, you know, in close proximity and going to concerts and um, being able to, you know, be in tight office spaces again. Um, and and I, I say that because I think the timeline um, of when that version of normal versus um, having um, some kind of re revised version of, you know, quote unquote normal, but ha being able to resume commerce, resume activity um, are going to be different. My expectation is that for a full normal, um, we are talking about years from now. Um, I'm expecting 20, late 2022, 2023 to be feasible for that. But I think when we get to the point where we are at that 70 or 80% vaccination, um, I think we'll, we'll begin to see parts of life resume in really critical ways. Um, and then it's going to be that slow, that slow resumption. Um, I also think of these questions about um, COVID-19 becoming endemic um, versus, you know, whether or not, um, you know, the, the two rounds of vaccination will be sufficient, um, the full vaccination rather, um, are going to determine what normalcy or return to normalcy look like. So in some ways, we still don't have enough to know um, what our you know future altered state or long term altered state will look like, but I think as we get towards um, an approval, we are starting to see that we're really looking at this time next year for um, some altered state, and then really 2022. Ten seconds left for you, Richard, and we'll close it out. Oh, Richard, you there? All right, Richard, I think we may have lost I, you, but. Um, I, Apologies. We're, we're the, uh, the hour, but if you have a couple, if you have a 30 second one, let's get it in. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with everything that Esther Nicolette said. Um, I do think that, you know, depending on uh, the, you know, the, the geographic region of the country areas, some areas are attempting far too early to return to, you know, quote unquote, quote unquote normal. Um, but I do think it will be a number of years before we get back to what we perceive as, 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 as fully normal. And I think it will depend uh, a great deal on uh, those levels of herd immunity. I think we're going to have to, you know, um, overcome potential hesitancy and lagging rates, just like we do with routine vaccines today. So I think it's, I think it's going to be quite a while. Well, thank you for those comments, each of you, and thank you for a stellar presentation. Uh, we remind our audience that you can review the full event, the video, the uh, transcript, all of it at, um, at the uh, website that is noted in the chat area, um, or go to our website, the Alliance for Health Policies website, which you uh, can do. Please fill out the evaluation survey, which you'll get immediately after uh, this event is over. And uh, we really do want you to fill those out. It helps us a great deal. The Alliance is so excited to continue to provide these, but we can't do it if we don't receive uh, information and feedback from our audience. Thank you for the audience. And I hope all of you will be uh, virtually applauding a stellar panel that's done a great job. Y'all take care and see you next time for the Alliance for Health Policy webinar.